So looking at FPA device chips, you think, well, that I mean, you make a chip, all of this just works. There's no, there's not a whole lot else you have to think about, right? You build the one chip, and then you start saying, time to build my designs. And for classical FPGAs that you would get commercially, of course that's what you would expect. We have decades of development of design tools. We can discuss the quality of those design tools and other aspects and another point. But all you kind of expect a whole bunch of just infrastructure just to be there. Well, when the SOC FPA was built, there was only a little bit sort of initially prototyped from earlier systems. And the question was, well, OK, well, we should just start working, right? And yet, that was only the beginning. Part of so obviously, it, you know, it's an amazing design in and of itself that you can get all of the fabric, microprocessor, and SRAM, and so forth. All of these things with this programming sort of components, but then it required a huge amount more on the hardware questions. One of which would be, you know, beyond beyond the theoretical questions. You know, it's like, could I scale this to a smaller technologies, like 100, 130 nanometer, and 40 nanometer from its original 350 nanometer? And you can really see that, yeah, that that risk is pretty low in terms of being able to do that design. Obviously, there's work to be involved, but that's, you can kind of get there. But that, that's a certain amount of work. But then you also have to ask, well, how do I get the programming infrastructure to work on chip to be completely on chip? Well, that requires some level of, of sort of not only just programming and assembly language programming, but also asking different questions of, uh, how do I rethink through the physics such that I can do this all in integer math without having to do a whole lot of function interpolation and so forth? How do you kind of move it into this space and use the physics of this sort of new sort of space to do the programming effectively? The other side is then also asking what is the PC board infrastructure going to look like? And that also becomes a huge part of this, which is often the case of, oh, look, I'll build a chip, and then somebody else will go build a test infrastructure. Well, that often turns out to be a huge amount of work. And in a fully configurable system, that is quite a bit. This was actually the very, one of, this was the very first infrastructure we used uh, for this chipset when we were, when we were building this in, you know, it's, I would say right around 2014 or so. 2014, 2015 was the early parts of that. Um, and then it could, once you build an infrastructure, that's, for example, USB-powered, USB-controlled, it allows you to then ask other questions of, well, maybe I could hook it into other platforms besides maybe a large desktop machine, maybe now a laptop, maybe now, you know, some sort of tablet device. But then that requires additional questions now to go beyond the very basic circuits, one of which is asking questions about built-in self-test. Some of it's also talking about hardware abstraction and talking about how do you calibrate and mismatch, deal with mismatch out of most of these structures. Now you might go, well, this all floating gates, so I can program out all the mismatch. This is correct. But it may turn out to be there's an initial mismatch because of some of the way some of the devices are initially coming back, the way things are set up. And you have to kind of deal with some of the initial, initial properties. Everyone would have to deal with this at one level or another. So uh, it's just, but how do you deal with it systematically? It has been, took a whole bunch of discussions and, and thinking through that. There's a whole set of questions on how do you talk about tools in terms of low-level tools, in terms of place and simple place and route, in terms of sort of targeting structures, as well as high-level tools, uh, which then actually allow you to, to use like a graphical format, like you know that looks like Simulink or an open-source version of Simulink is what we use, uh, which is sort of XCOS built in the Scilab structure. You can also then talk about okay, now can I start talking about larger tools for analog? Now this is already stepping into a space where there's very little done and very little done because people usually don't have a lot of reason to use it um, because if things are very low level component you don't need to but now this becomes not just a nice to have or an interesting discussion or maybe someday it's like I have to have this stuff or I really slow down my design and then we can also start talking about you know building remote systems so other people can get to it we can talk about this from an education standpoint and even beyond this, there's a whole bunch of questions that start to address once you can abstract and have built things into tools. So you have the experts move things into that space. Now you can actually start abstracting enough that you can actually bring people coming from a level down in, computer, in sort of the computer science to go, oh, I can understand now what you have. And you can now start really building up those, that concept in terms of computing. So this is really important to kind of see this, is that usually when you start to power up your device and just think, oh, look, I just draw a couple boxes and compiled it, and you think, 
there's nothing there. This, this is really easy. And you're like, well, actually to do this right, there's a whole number of system system pieces, which in the digital space we just take as as a given, but it's really been decades and decades of infrastructure building. 